Conviction by Kate Scott. It's not a case of simple escape. It's more that I like to feel stretched and to silence my mind by making my body the predominant part. I even enjoy the torture of it, the rhythm of the repeated thought. No more. No more. My brain the whip, urging the flagging body on until I finally allow myself to fold over in a bow to myself, a salute to my own determination. I'm always tense running by the canal, on the lookout. If they knew, people would think I was crazy to run here. It is outside the accepted borders, and even though it isn't actually prohibited, it's understood that you aren't supposed to go outside your own territory. Unpleasant rumours persist about what happens to those who cross the boundary from north to south. I'm not a rebellious person, but I like the idea of extension. I like the feeling of going beyond. Our lives are so curtailed now, run along the government's tight beginnings, middles and ends. We have security, we have structure, but we have no choice, no undulations in our paths. I've always felt suspended in my own life, not yet committed to any particular direction, and so I run the same route over and over, looking for some new turn in my head. Just as I'm passing the second lock of the canal, listening to a song on my MZ-60, Merrin interrupts. Jim, I flip the switch from one-way received communication, the song automatically pausing itself. Yes, you're running then. Merrin sees my runs as self-indulgent. She sees actions as either contributing or not to the good of society. My running definitely falls into the latter category. I was before you called. Perhaps it is feeling defensive that makes me doubly shocked to see that a boy has appeared in front of me. I haven't been paying attention, and so I haven't seen his approach, but he's probably come from one of the warehouses just behind me. All right, he says. Marin, I have to go. I switch off the receiver. Hello. I say, hoping I sound relaxed. I'm very aware of my exposed skin. The boy is about sixteen, with dyed black hair with blonde roots. He's wearing one of the rubber suits canal workers wear to protect their skin from the chemicals, and for a split second, before I see the scar, I wonder if he really is a worker, or if it is some kind of statement. Some kids from our territory do dress up as if they're from the canal side, but the boy must have got splashed during his work. The right side of his face is covered in a melted skin scar, and he is evidently self-conscious about it, because he puts his hand up to his face as he sees me notice. Nothing like this ever happened to you? He points to the scar, becoming defiant. No. Lucky. Lucky you. He pauses, and then turns and spits on the ground, narrowly missing my shoe, Shall I try and make a run for it? No, I can handle this. It's just a boy. A boy from the canal side. You're from the north, he says. Yes, yes, I am, I say. I'm trying to keep my face slack and unresponsive like his. I will myself not to smile, not to seem as if I am trying to get him on my side. A smile would be giving away power, a smile would be telling him I am scared, as if he didn't already know. What are you doing here? For a second I think the question is genuinely curious, and I'm about to explain, then I catch myself as I see the sneer twitching his lip. Turn the wrong corner. I'll say. He spits again, this time hitting the toe of my right shoe. We both look at it, and then we look up at each other. You read all sorts of things about the canal people, about how they're not like us, they're subnormal, violent, the usual prejudiced cant. Merrin rants endlessly about the misrepresentation of the canal people, even though we don't actually know any. Merrin is a radical, that is, she is passionate and concerned, and in a constant fit of motivated anger. 
I am just your average right-thinking, or rather left-thinking, well-intentioned liberal. And like all well-intentioned liberals confronted with reality, I am petrified, but desperate not to show it. Turn the wrong corner, I repeat. I deliberately ignore the gesture of the spit. You do that a lot, the boy says. He sounds neutral now, confident that he's established his authority, his superiority in the situation. What? I am shocked. This is the first time I have ever seen anyone on my runs by the canal. I have flattered myself that I have the gift of fading into the background. You seem to get lost a lot. Right here, the boy says. It's funny, that. Getting lost in exactly the same place each time. I suppose it is. The sweat from fear, as opposed to exercise, is very different, I note, in the part of my head that remains detached from what is going on. Another part of my mind, the hysterical side, is showing me headlines. North City native killed in canal side brawl. Canal boy goes berserk, maims North City man in lock side fight. But you're not really lost, are you? His eyes have a hypnotic stare. He doesn't look inside himself. That's what scares me most. Just in the way that my mind seems to be separating off in lots of different directions. What I should do. What has just been said. What might come next. His mind seems to be elsewhere too. And I don't like to think what that means. No, I suppose I'm not. I say this as firmly as I can trying to sound sure of myself, trying to get the power back. Well, what is it? Some sort of tourist trip? He isn't reacting to my tone. No, I just like to run here, that's all. His face slams shut. I have produced some signal, become a representative for all he hates. You just like to run here. Each word is a spike that he is sticking into the ground around me. I couldn't move if I tried. He is fencing me in with his anger. Must be nice to be able to go wherever you want. Surprised you want to come here, though. Place where all the crap ends up. Do you know what's at the top of this canal? I nod. Of course I know. It's the pure waters. The transparent stream that winds its way through our flats and offices in the north. Music is piped in alongside its sparkling perfection, unlike the stagnant, still canal. Yeah, your perfect little stream. And then you put your crap in it and don't worry if we get splashed, right? The north has to be kept perfect. I don't know what to say, I just keep looking at him. You make me sick, spitting the words out like bullets. I stand there and take them. It's all I can do to keep from nodding in agreement. What have I been thinking of, anyway? Seeing running by the canal as some sort of freedom, leaving the boundaries behind. But to this boy it must seem like a taunt. Look at me. Look at what I have. If only I could explain how little freedom we enjoy for all our clear water. But he wouldn't understand. And who could blame him? He has the melt scar, I have clear skin. He wears a protective suit, I bear my body. I think of Merrin. She is angry too, but she has faith in herself, in her ability to change things. She organises huge internet rallies where people click in their protest posters to crash the websites of blacklisted companies. At some point, I have become the embodiment of all the apathy Merrin rails against. It isn't enough that I agree with her. I don't act. It doesn't seem to matter to her that I don't feel smart enough or sure enough to act. She knows that running is my respite, and she sneers at it. Sees it as selfish. She'd think my route patronising if she knew. I stare at the boy. Can you help me get out? What? For the first time he sounds startled uncertain. I have left the script behind, and I see again that he is just a boy, a young boy, with a scar. I want to leave. What? Properly get out? He looks incredulous. Do I really know what I'm saying? 
I think again of Merrin, of her constant static anger. Properly get out, I reply firmly. You're mad, the boy says, trying to laugh. He isn't able to. He can see that I'm serious. You really mean it, he says. The terror constricting my spine suddenly loosens with his look of tentative admiration. It suddenly seems vital to make this boy like me. The only way I can think of doing that is to destroy every assumption he has, even if that means asking him how to destroy myself. Yes, I really mean it. All right, then. I'll show you, says the boy. He turns and begins to walk fast off towards the warehouses. Well, come on, then, if you're coming. He starts running down one of the narrow lanes between the buildings, the mud surface pockmarked with the footprints of the canal workers. I follow him, slowly at first, but then picking up pace. We're heading to the high wires. I realise he is going to show me one of the famous gaps, the irregular openings in the high wire fencing that marks out the world we are permitted to live in. I've always drifted. At first... Merrin saw this as a conscious rejection of the narrow lines we are given to live within. Now she sees it for what it has always been, a lack of courage to think, to decide, to act. Now I see my runs not as escape, but as training. What do I have to go back to? Merrin's disappointments? My frail protests at the social preoccupation with preening, primped happiness? There's one! He is pointing ahead to a gap, deceptively innocuous at this distance. His eyes are watching to see whether I will try to back out of it. I peer ahead. I don't know what has got into me. Here I am, trying to be some kind of hero. Make some sort of statement. I'm not sure I'm up to it. Suddenly there is the sound of running feet. A group of armed guardsmen appear from another of the narrow lanes. I almost feel relief. I can't go through with it now, and even the boy can't blame me. I look back at the guardsmen, who are within a few metres of us now, and feel my breath catch in my throat. It's Merrin. Merrin is there, with the guardsmen. With them, among them, one of them. I look down at the MZ-60 I am still clutching. The location switch is on. I must have flicked it when I was running. She knew exactly where to find me. Maybe she always knew. Some part of me isn't even shocked. I have heard of such conversions before. The greater the height, the darker the fall. I look at her and she looks back, unflinching. It is the face of someone who has changed beyond all recognition. I look at the boy, no longer afraid to smile, and he smiles back. We both know I won't make it. I'll be brought in one way or another, but I can feel a thought running in both our heads. Perhaps this is just the beginning of a story, the story of a runner who makes it. The thought shivers down my spine. I recognize the feeling. It's happiness, the happiness of conviction.